My name is Nathan Auberg. Good evening and welcome to Your Farmland, fi Your Finances and whether it's wise to buy farmland now. And we're really glad that you're here. Um, in fact, there are some people who have actually been the inspiration for us doing this webinar. Uh, as part of our land access work, we advise <laughs> farmland owners and we've, we've talked to a number of beginning farmers who are really anxious and eager to buy their own farmland, but they're trying to figure out whether that makes sense for their finances. And because we kept hearing that, that challenge, uh, we decided it made a lot of sense to bring in Paul and have a good webinar. It's a classic kind of example of your head versus your heart. Your heart says, I would really love to wake up in the morning and have my own farmland to know that whatever I plant, the trees that I plant, the soil that I build is going to be part of my life as long as I want it to be. That's a really powerful, strong urge. At the same time, of course, we always have our head that kind of tells us, you know what, let's think about this carefully. Do I have the finances to make this work? Am I going to take on too much debt? Is that debt going to limit what I can do with the rest of my farm operation? And so uh, we're hoping that today will help you sort of balance your head and your heart. And so one of the things that I want to do, because so many of us share a common desire, a common interest, a common passion for local food and sustainable food, we're, we're essentially a community. So I'd like everyone in the chat to share your name and the city you're from. And if you're not from Illinois, if you could share your state too. And I think that'd be fun for everyone to see. And if you are not a farm farmer, if you could share with your um, name and uh, location how you would like to help farmers, I think just a sentence or a phrase would be super helpful. And then we're also going to do a poll that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, Jim's going to launch it very shortly. Yep. The, first, the, first, <coughs> the first question is going to be on a one to 10 scale, how eager, how impatient are you to buy a farm in the next year or two on a scale of one to 10? So 10 would be, I need to buy a farm immediately. One would be, hey, I'm pretty patient. When it happens, it happens. So that's the first poll question. And then the second poll question will be um, on one to 10 scale, using your head, how confident am I that now is the right time to buy farmland in terms of my finances? Also on one to 10 scale. So I wanna give everyone a chance to sort of uh, take those two poll questions. We'll give you just like 30 seconds to answer and then Jim uh, will share the results. Again, I welcome everyone who's coming in as we do this. We're just asking people to give your name and location in your chat and to also do the poll that uh, Jim has posted. So, how are we doing, Jim? We're doing good. I see the results are coming in for both questions. Okay. You want to share what you're seeing so far? Sure. Um, so it looks like on question one, how eager are you to buy land in the next two years. Um, we've got, uh, it's pretty even, kind of in the five to 10 range. So we've got probably got the most tens, very eager, and then uh, a couple people each in the five to nine range. Okay. Um, one or two in the two range. And then the second question, how confident are you that your fin financial situation would make uh, that a good and wise choice. Um, we're kind of all over the maps. There's a lot of a lot of people that said five. <laughs> Several people said eight. Uh, a couple said nine and ten. And then it's kind of a couple that said two. Um, and then it's sporadic from there. So, excellent. So good. I think this illustrates kind of what we're after, and um, I think you will enjoy what you hear. I, one of the things that really made this poignant today is I talked with my, one of my coworkers and his sister and his brother-in-law um, thought they had a long-term lease arrangement uh, out east in Virginia. They just learned that that lease is not going to be a long-term lease arrangement. And so they have said they're essentially tired of being farmer nomads. And um, so that's a very strong drive and we live in a sort of a, a challenging world. 
As way of introduction, uh, again, I'm Nathan Auberg with the Liberty Prairie Foundation. Very happy you are here. We're a nonprofit located in the Prairie Crossing Conservation Community in uh, Grays Lake, Illinois, in Lake County, Illinois. We have a 94 acre organic farm that we use for a number of programs. Uh, my particular program is Northeast Illinois FarmLink, which is a farmland access program designed to help connect farmers with farmland owners. I carry out that program with Jim Perchagina, who you've already, already met. And our, we are very passionate about trying to help farmers and farmland owners achieve their farming dreams. Um, you can find us, by the way, at IllinoisFarmLink.org, and we're super helpful, super happy to help you with advising and however we can. Uh, I want to sort of thank some people uh, and recognize some people. One is Jim, Jim Perchadina. Great to work with Jim. He's also a homesteader and really doing some cool things in Woodstock, Illinois. We have a number of uh, partners of ours on, on this call. I think I counted like six or seven. Thank you, each of you. It's a pleasure to work with you uh, and your institution. It's really great to have partners in this work. Um, I also want to thank uh, a number of you who made donations to us during the registration process. That was super generous. Uh, and finally, we certainly want to offer our gratitude to our uh, underwriter, which is Foodland Opportunity, uh, localizing the Chicago Food Shed. This is a collaborative funding in initiative between the Chicago Community Trust and the Kinship Foundation. Their aim is to create a local resilient food economy that conserves and protects land and natural resources. They're excellent people to work with. So just before I introduce uh, Paul, just a few quick things. Uh, we are recording this. Uh, we will send you a link uh, with the YouTube um, uh, option uh, that you can share with other people. Um, we will be taking questions if you can use the chat function. Uh, I'll moderate those. Uh, Paul is gonna be stopping at different segments during his presentation so we can uh, jump in with questions. Uh, and then finally, uh, we are going to mute everyone. And if you could also halt your video feed, that'll give us a little bit better bandwidth. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Paul. Uh, Paul Dietman is Senior Lending Specialist on the Diversified Markets Team at Compure Financial, a member-owned rural lending cooperative and farm credit system institution serving Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Paul and his colleague, Sai Tao, are responsible for Compeer's Emerging Markets Loan Program, which provides loans and financial assistance to farmers who market their products through local food systems. Prior to joining Compeer, Paul spent 16 years uh, working in the Wisconsin agricultural system, uh, including 11 years as a county agricultural agent with the UW Extension. Uh, he also is co-author of the books, Fearless Farm Finances, Farm Financial Management Demystified, and Financial Risk Management for Specialty Crop Farmers. He's a frequent speaker at conferences. And above all, I just wanna say, uh, he has really devoted his, his energies and his skills to really helping a lot of food farmers and landowners figure out how finances and farming and a happy, secure family life all go together. And he's really passionate about it. And we're really grateful that he's doing what he's doing. Paul, why don't you take it away? All right, thanks, Nathan. Really appreciate that kind introduction and glad everybody could join us tonight. Uh, let me share my screen here. <clears throat> All right, so as Nathan said, I'm Paul Dittman. I'm with Compeer Financial and uh, co-lead the Emerging Markets Loan Program, which is a loan program for farmers who mar market products direct to consumers or do some sort of value-added uh, processing or marketing or production. Um, and I teach a lot of workshops on farm financial management issues. Um, and so we're gonna talk tonight about kind of the basic farm finances and then how do we take those farm finances and try to figure out whether it makes sense to buy land or, um, also a little bit more broadly, how it makes sense to make investments, make capital investments in the farm operation. So we wanna just figure out our, how do we decide if we're in a good position to make a big capital investment, like buying a piece of, of farmland, especially now when it's so expensive. Um, but also how do we know if a given investment is a wise use of our money? I wanted to start off by maybe talking just a little bit more about my background that's, uh, that's not part of my bio. 
Um, when I was a kid, I was actually born in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, so I wasn't born into a farming family. We moved to a small town in Western Illinois when I was a kid, we moved out to Mendota, Illinois. Some of you from Illinois know where that is. Um, and when we lived in Mendota, oh, I'm sorry. Was that a question? I don't think so. You can oh, okay. Going. Yeah, so um, when we lived in Mendota, I joined 4-H and I started working on farms in the area and I just fell in love with agriculture. And, and uh, from that time on, I wanted to own my own farm. But uh, not being smart enough to be born into a farming family or a wealthy family, which is really the two best ways to become farmland owners, um, I figured I'm gonna have to figure out how to do this on my own. And so uh, something that I learned when I was in college at the University of Illinois is something that I'm gonna share with you later today. And it's, it's one of the most powerful um, financial investment tools that, um, that uh, I can think of. And it's, it's something that I've used over and over in my own life to try to get to a point where I could own land. And this, these pictures here are uh, pictures of my own farm, which is in the Driftless region. It's down uh, near Lone Rock, Wisconsin. It's 67 acres, so it's not a very big farm. Um, I took some of the land that was, um, that was in um, row crop production, really shouldn't have been in row crop production. That's the picture on the, on the left there. It was pretty rocky. And we converted that to managed pasture and, uh, and we grazed heifers for one of the neighbors. Um, but in order to get to the point of owning some farmland, I had to, I had to save and I had to invest and I had to, make, uh, I had to save as much as I could and make the best investment decisions I could make too. And that's uh, one of the biggest things I want to try to get across tonight as we go along here is, is how to make these investment decisions in a way that it, it sets you up for future success and get to the point where you can, you can own your own land. Because obviously, uh, you wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in owning land. Um, and whether it makes sense to, to buy land right now or it makes sense to buy land later, at some point, you're probably going to want to buy some. And, and so you want to be set up uh, and be in the best position to do that when the time comes. So I think it helps when we talk about farm financial management, I think it helps to have an example farm. So you kind of have something in mind. You can kind of picture what this farm looks like, who this person is, uh, what their farm operation is all about. And so our example farm that we're going to use tonight, it's a very small farm. It's um, we're Triple M Produce is the name of it. It's a small scale fresh market vegetable farm. It's owned and operated by a person named Mary Miller. This is a fictitious person, by the way. Um, She's uh, starting out this year, 2021, is her first growing year. She's planning to grow on leased land for her first two years, 2021, 2022, and then would like to buy land in her third year of production, 2023. She owns a house in town right now. She plans to sell it when she buys land uh, in 2023. She's going to maintain her off-farm income while she's leasing land, kind of getting her production system down. And then once she finally obtains her own land, She's going to um, quit her off-farm job and is going to farm full-time. Maybe make it up, make up some of her family living costs with um, with some part-time off-farm income. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to figure out what kind of financial resources does Mary have available to her right now, and then we have to try to anticipate what she's going to have available to her when it comes time to buy her land, because we want to be able to see if she's going to be in a position to do that at that point. And the way that we look at uh, what kind of financial position she's in right now is with a balance sheet. And so if you've ever taken a loan, your lender I'm sure has asked for a balance sheet at, or a personal financial statement. So it's a listing of all the things that you own and all the things that you owe. So on the balance sheet, on a farm balance sheet, we have current farm assets, intermediate farm assets, long-term farm assets, and then we have non-farm assets. So in Mary's case, she's got $5,000 in cash and checking that's a current farm asset. We're gonna consider it to be a farm asset. Current assets are um, anything that's cash, anything that's gonna to convert to cash within a year's time, or anything that's gonna be used up on the farm within a year's time. So if she had prepaid expenses, she prepaid soil amendments or something like that, that would be a current asset. It's gonna be used up on the farm uh, in a year's time. Um, if she had market livestock, that would be considered a current asset because it would be something that would convert to cash within a year's time. So current assets, that's cash, anything that's gonna to convert to cash, anything that's gonna be used up on the farm within a year. Intermediate farm assets, this is a category that, that businesses outside of agriculture typically don't have, but these are assets that have a life of at least a year and less than about 10 years. 
So machinery and equipment falls in here. Breeding livestock falls in here. In Mary's case, she's got $200 worth of uh, farm tools. Um, she's got a vehicle that's worth about $10,000. She's gonna devote it to her farm operation. So we're gonna consider it to be a farm asset. The non-farm asset down here towards the bottom is her house. Uh, we don't wanna consider that to be a farm asset because if we were um, running profit and loss statements and we were trying to calculate rate of return on assets, rate of return on equity, we'd be forcing the house to generate a return and that's not fair, you have to live someplace. And so we typically put that down as a non-farm asset. On the liability side, current liabilities, that's anything that's due now or that's gonna come due within a year's time. So credit card debt um, shows up as a current liability, 100% because it's all due right now. The thing that gets missed when we calculate current liabilities a lot of times is the principal that's due within the next year on a longer term loan. So in Mary's case, she's got a loan on her vehicle and the principal that's gonna come due within the next year on that vehicle loan is $3,940. So that's the principal coming due within the next year. It's due within a year, so it's considered a current liability. If you look down to intermediate liabilities, any of the balance on that car loan that's due beyond one year is the, the principal balance that gets placed in that category on the balance sheet. And so that's $4,060. And then down below, we have a non-farm liability. That's her home mortgage. And that was $200,000. So this is kind of a snapshot of what her financials look like basically right now. This is balance sheets from October 1st, 2020. Um, I typically encourage people to update their balance sheet at least once a year on January 1st or December 31st. Because if you can get in the habit of doing that, constantly um, updating on January 1st or December 31st every year, your balance sheets are going to line up with your tax return. And then it makes it really easy to, to calculate um, a lot of different measures of profitability and cash flow. So this is kind of where she's starting from here with her balance sheet. Do you have any questions on balance sheet? I went through that relatively quickly. I usually spend a lot more time on that, but I want to get to, to some other things here. And there's a, and Paul, there's a question from uh, Rachel. Her question is, would an on-site property rental uh, events, Airbnb be long-term assets? Yeah, they would. Any uh, long-term asset would be anything that has a life of more than 10 years or so. So typically on a farm balance sheet, it's going to be the, uh, the buildings, it's going to be fencing, it would be irrigation systems, it's the land itself, you know, so it's um, all those things would, would show up as long-term farm assets. Yeah, and if, you're, if you've got an Airbnb or something on farm, uh, we would consider that to be a long-term farm asset as well, because it's, a, it's an income generating asset. Okay, and then uh, another question, uh, what about IRAs, annuities, et cetera? Are those, those assets? They are assets. Um, and as a lender, I'm gonna ask for those things. If you're um, putting together a farm balance sheet and you're using it just for your own purposes, you may or may not wanna put those on there. But, um, but as a lender, we look at, at sort of a global balance sheet. You know? And so if you've got different entities, you know, sometimes I'll, uh, some of my clients will have LLCs or have a C corporation or something, and then they've got their personal side. And when we're considering a loan request, we put it all together and we look at it as a, on a global basis. Um, but yeah, those are, and it's important to have those things on there, um, you know, when you're applying for a loan, because, you know, it just, it strengthens your equity position. I think that's all we have right now. Okay. So that was the balance sheet. Um, now we're gonna move on to enterprise budgets. Here we're, here's where we're looking at um, what kind of income is she expecting to take in each year and what sort of expenses is she expecting to, to incur? And when I think about an enterprise budget, I think of it as sort of a mini feasibility study. You know, you can almost do this on the back of an envelope and figure out, okay, if I have X number of acres and my yield is so much and the price of my product is so much, I know how much I'm, I'm gonna be bringing in per acre and then I calculate my cost per acre and it gives me a rough idea of whether or not there's gonna be any profit. Um, a mistake I see some people making is they, they do the enterprise budget and they stop there. I'm gonna show you, we're gonna start with the enterprise budgets and then we're gonna develop it into a month by month cash flow projection. And it's really important to do that cash flow. We're gonna start with, the, with her enterprise budgets though. And these are the assumptions that she's using in the enterprise budgets for her farm. In 2021, she's expecting to sell produce for 16 weeks. She's gonna start in mid-June. She's gonna end in mid-October. Her average market sales are gonna be $200 a week. 
and she's again going to be selling for 16 weeks so that's $3,200 gross income that she's expecting. Um, she also thinks she's going to be able to sell an additional $50 a week to friends or to restaurants. Um, so 50 times 16 weeks is $800. So she's expecting $4,000 of gross income uh, for the year in 2021. And then she's got a bunch of variable costs. And when we talk about variable costs, these are the kinds of costs that you sit down and you write out a check for. So they're, um, they're the costs of production. They're things that if you weren't producing anything, you wouldn't have. So her variable costs, she's got some vehicle expenses because she's going to have to drive to the markets and she's also going to be delivering to restaurants and things. $450 is what she's expecting there. She's got to pay fees at the markets. Um, so that's $200. She's got potting soil and compost that she needs to buy. And she's figuring that's going to be 200. Insurance, 150. Seeds and plants, 400. And then other miscellaneous supplies. So it could be bags or um, pots or anything, um, $680. Now, I realize some of you are operating bigger farm operations than this. This is a pretty small scale farm. So don't give up on us, just add a couple of zeros to these numbers, but that uh, this is the basic concept that we're, that we're uh, presenting. Um, in 2022, she's still gonna sell for 16 weeks. Um, she thinks she'll be able to double her sales because the second year, hopefully she understands what the customers are looking for. She gets her growing system down a little bit better. And so she's anticipating that she's gonna have $400 a week in, in gross income from the markets. So that's $6,400. And she thinks she can sell an additional $100 a week to friends and to restaurants. So that's another $1,600. Her variable costs, some of these costs go up and some don't. So vehicle expenses, she's still going to be going to the same markets and, and selling at the same restaurants, basically. So vehicle expense stays the same. Market fees stay the same. Potting soil and compost doubled because she's doubling her production. Uh, insurance costs stay the same. Seeds and plants doubled because she's doubling her production. And then other supplies didn't quite double, but it did go up because she's increasing the scale of her, of her enterprise. And this is what the enterprise budget for 2021 looks like. So we start with the gross income on the top line, that was $4,000. She's got all of those, um, those production expenses and marketing expenses that ends up being $2,030. She's got a land charge in here. So she's gonna pay $100 for the land that she's using. And then she wants to pay herself something. Um, and she, it's not a whole lot, it's probably not really even covering her labor costs, but she at least wants to put a, a number in there so that she's not working for free. And so she's putting a thousand dollars in for the value of her labor the first year. So um, that land charge and the value of the owner's labor, those are considered overhead costs. Those are costs that you would have whether you're producing anything or not. If she decided to, to um, become a farmer and she's renting the land and then she changed her mind and decided not to grow anything, she still had to pay that hundred dollars. And the value of her labor is also considered to be overhead as well. So her total costs are $3,130. She's expecting 4,000 of income minus 31.30, gives her $870 of net return that she's expecting in, in year one. Year two, she doubled her income or she's expecting to double her income, get all the, um, the operating expenses and the overhead costs. She doubled her land charge because she's um, doubling the size of her uh, productive area. And then she's doubling the amount that she's paying herself. So total costs are 5150 and her bottom line uh, net return, she's expecting $2,850. So again, a mistake that I see some farmers make, especially new farmers, um, they'll do these enterprise budgets and then they just stop there and they figure, well, $2,850, you know, if I double again the next year, I'm gonna be over 5,000. If I double again the year after that, I'm over 10,000. Um, but this is, you know, if you look at an enterprise budget, that gross income doesn't come in in January and then all the expenses go out. The income comes in late in the summer, but a lot of these expenses have to be paid early on. And that's why it's important that we take it to the next step, which is to develop it into a cash flow projection. And so we're going to expand those enterprise budgets into month by month cash flow projections. And this is what it looks like. So up here in the upper left hand corner, Mary's going to take 2,000 of her, of her personal savings. She's going to open up a farm checking account and she's going to deposit that 2,000 into the farm checking account. She's got no income coming in the month of January. And in this case, she has no expenses going out. So she's ending the month. She still has that 2,000 in the checking account. So that starts February. She's got nothing coming in in February, but now she has to pay her land rent. So 100 bucks got paid out of there and she ends with 1,900 in the account. And that starts March. Now she's got some more expenses. She had to buy some um, supplies. 
and she paid for seeds and plants. She had to go pick them up. So she's got some uh, vehicle expense in there. So $550 that she wrote out and she ended that month with 1,350. And so you can kind of see how the cash flow works through the year. She finally starts bringing in some income in June and then July, August, September, October. She's still got expenses in all those months. She starts paying herself a little bit. Here's where she's taken out that $1,000 that she wanted to pay herself for the year. So she's taken out $100 a month uh, during the growing season, a little bit more in the height of the growing season. And she ends the year, the lower uh, right-hand corner, 2270 is what she's got left in the checking account at the end of the year. Oh, I should point out here too, she back in um, May, she bought a rototiller and some other tools for $600. So that got paid out of the account. And what I'm doing with this cash flow projection, I'm watching this bottom line. And I want to make sure that the bottom line never goes negative because if it does, that means that she was sitting down writing out checks and all of a sudden her checking account was empty and she's got to try to figure out what to do to, to um, finish paying the bills for the month, whether it's putting things on credit cards or letting bills slide or whatever. And so in her case, she never runs negative and that's good. So she ended the year with 2270. Now we're moving into 2022 and what the cash flow is going to look like. So here's that 2270 got carried over to January 1st. So she's still got that in her checking account. And the cash flow pattern pretty much follows the year before. And now she's going to end the year with 5320 is what she's expecting. So Nathan, I'm going to stop there and see if anybody has any questions about anything. Uh, there was one question. Do you consider USDA farm bill payments as part of your enterprise budget? Yeah, if you know for sure you're going to get those payments, I would include them in your expected gross revenue. And um, and I I see a lot of people who do that. You know, they may have uh, maybe they sign up for an NRCS contract or something, and and they know that that check is going to come in mm. uh, right after they expend the money to put in uh, the practices that they're implementing or whatever. Um, so yeah, definitely put that in. The one that um, when I work with conventional farmers, the one that's kind of a question mark is crop insurance proceeds. You know, they know what they're going to pay for crop insurance, but you never know if you're, if you're actually going to be getting an indemnity payment from crop insurance. But if you know that it's a government payment that's you're definitely going to get, that, yeah, you definitely want to plug that in. Okay. And then we have another question that I think someone else uh, answered, which was, how do you figure in large capital costs like tractors, Bobcat, Baylor, et cetera? Uh, et cetera? We are an S corporation. How does that figure in? Yeah, let me back up here for a second. I typically don't, um, don't include those large capital expenses in the enterprise budget. Or if I do, I'll include them under overhead, but I'll, I'll include just a fraction of the cost in the, in the overhead. You know, I'll include the depreciation, repairs, you know, the dirty five, depreciation, interest, repairs, taxes, and insurance. Um, but where they show up here in the cash flow projection, if you bought a piece of equipment, we're going to put it in the capital purchases, whatever month that is. You know, and you, maybe you're anticipating that in 2022, I'm going to buy a new tractor in April. So I'm going to put that, whatever that amount is here uh, in April. And if you're taking a loan up here, you can see there's a line for proceeds from new loans. So we're going to put the loan proceeds in there. And a lot of times there'll be a difference. You know, you might maybe you buy a tractor for it's a small tractor, you pay 25,000, you put 5,000 in and you finance 20. So you're going to have $20,000 coming from the new loans up here, and you're going to have 25,000 going out down here. So we do want to track it in the cash flow, but we typically don't include it under the, the enterprise budgets. Okay, that's it. Okay. All right, so now we're to 2023. This is when Mary wants to buy her farm. So we want to see what kind of shape she's in at this point and whether or not it makes sense to buy this farm. So here we are, January 1st, 2023. She's got $5,000 in her personal cash and checking. Um, remember, we ended the year of 2022 with 5320 in the farm checking account. Here's where it shows up on the balance sheet. So there's 5320 there. So total current assets, 10320. She's got machinery and equipment worth $800. She started with 200, she bought $600 worth in 2021 and we didn't show up being depreciated. So we're just gonna include it at 800. She still got that vehicle for 10,000. Um, she still has her non-farm uh, asset, her home, which is worth 250,000. 
Over here on the liability side, she paid off her car loan. So there's no principal due on that car loan anymore. She still has $4,000 of credit card debt. There's no intermediate term balance on the car loan because again, it's been completely zeroed out. And here's what she still owes on the mortgage on her house at that point, 198.85. So her plan is now that she's in 2023, she wants to buy this farm. She wants to sell her house. She figures she's gonna have roughly $60,000 to put down uh, for a down payment on the farm and also to make some improvements on the farm. Um, she's been looking around. She thinks a farm with a house and at least five acres of tillable land in the area that she's looking uh, is gonna cost about $400,000. In order to buy that farm, she's gonna use the USDA Farm Service Agency Beginning, farm, uh, Beginning Farmer Down Payment Program. This is a program that uh, we partner with a lot. It's a great program for a beginning farmer. You have to have at least um, two years of farming experience, preferably three years of farming experience. It has to be farm management experience. So you have to be uh, making management level decisions on a farm. And that doesn't mean that you run the entire operation. It might mean you make the seed decisions for the farm operation or fertility decisions or breeding decisions if it's a livestock operation. So you have to have some farm management experience to, you, to access this program. Um, if you can access the program, the down payment is only 5%. So she's buying a $400,000 farm. She only has to put down $20,000. FSA will finance 180,000, which is 45% of the purchase. So they finance 180,000 at one and a half percent interest. And that's 20 years locked. So the payment on that would be $10,484 per year. Under this program, we finance 50% of the, of the land purchase. So that'd be 200,000. Um, this is a couple of years from now. Our interest rates aren't quite this high right now. I'm showing 5%, although they're, they're creeping back up. They're not far off of that, but, um, and that would be on a 30 year fixed rate. The payment on that would be $13,010. So the total mortgage payment she's looking at when she buys the farm is 23,494. Now we have to build some new assumptions into her enterprise budget because all of a sudden she's got a lot more acreage that she's farming. Um, she's gonna increase her um, the uh, sales to farmer's markets or through farmer's markets and direct sales to restaurants and friends by 50% from where she was in 2022. She's adding a CSA component to the farm in 2023 and she figures she can pick up 50 subscribers that first year at $600 for a full subscription. So that's $30,000 of gross income there. Um, her vehicle expenses are going up a lot because now she's living a little bit further out. She's got more markets or more deliveries to make. She has to deliver to um, pickup sites for CSA and all those sorts of things. A lot of her other variable costs are gonna be a lot higher as she's trying to build uh, soil fertility on this new farm. Um, she used $20,000. Remember she had 60,000 when she sold her house. She used 20,000 of that as the down payment for the farm. She still had $40,000 left and she's planning to take that 40,000 she figures uh, when she buys a farm, she's gonna have to put up a hoop house. She's gonna need to put in some irrigation. Um, house is probably gonna need some remodeling. So she wants to reserve some of her cash to, to do some home remodeling. So she's pretty much got the 40,000 spoken for. Again, she plans to quit her off farm job at that time and pick up part-time work in the off season. And because of that, the farm is gonna have to cover that mortgage, which is over 24,000 a year and then most of the family living costs because she's not gonna have a lot of off-farm income anymore. And this is what her cash flow looks like. So she figures she's, she'll end up uh, making that purchase in February. So she's gonna sell the house. She gets her 60,000 there. She's borrowing 380,000 between FSA and, and Compere. So there's the cash that came in during the month of February, 440,000. Here's where she bought the farm, 400,000 capital purchase went out and she's gonna end the month with $45,320 in the farm checking account. And then she's got sort of the same cash flow pattern that she had in the past, although she's got some CSA subscriptions coming in in April and May, uh, but she's got expenses that have to be paid. Um, now all of a sudden she's got a mortgage payment that has to be made and that's $1,958 a month. She has to start taking family living draw out of the farm and that's 3,000 a month. And that's only 36,000 a year of family living costs, which is really pretty low. Um, so she's, she plans to live pretty modestly. Um, here's that 40,000 where she was buying the hoop house and, and doing some home remodeling and putting an irrigation system. So that 40,000 is gone right there. And then 
we're watching the bottom line here. Cash flow is okay until we get to the fall. And then in October, um, we run a negative amount. And then it gets a little bit more negative in the November. It gets a little more negative in December. And so really in this year, 2023, we need about $10,000 more cash flow than what we're projecting in order to make everything work. Um, she back up here, remember she was gonna have some off-farm income and we're only projecting about $7,500 of off-farm income in the off season here, um, October, November, December. And then we had to run this out one more uh, year. I just wanna take a look and see, okay, that was kind of a transition year as she's buying the farm, selling her house and all that sort of thing. What is this gonna look like in a more typical year when the cash flow pattern is, is a bit more set? We're carrying forward that negative $10,000, $10,360 balance from the end of, of uh, 2023 that carries forward into January of 2024. And the cash flow pattern pretty much follows the same except now she's got mortgage payments every month in the whole, uh, every month of the year. She has to pay her family living cost every month of the year. Um, and you can see now we're almost 36,000 negative cash flow for the month of 2024. So this looks like, uh, like a pretty tough situation at that point. So what options might she have? Well, she might push that farm purchase back a year or more, you know, just wait on the farm purchase, kind of get her, her production system a little bit more up and running. Uh, bringing in more cash flow from the farm operation. She may want to save up more cash or aggressively pay down her home mortgage in 2021, 2022, so that when she buys the farm in 23, she's got a little bit more cash to put into it up front and take less, uh, less debt on the farm. Uh, she may want to rent more land rather than buying a farm, maybe expand the operation on rented land, not on, on a purchased farm. She may want to try to find a less expensive farm, but you know, if you're in Northern Illinois, try to find a farm for less than 400,000 in this market, that, that's gonna be a tough, uh, tough thing to do, I think. Um, maybe she wants to add a livestock or poultry enterprise. Maybe she wants to add an agritourism component. Uh, maybe she wants to maintain a higher level of off-farm income. So there's, there are different things that could be done, but most likely if she runs this scenario and looks at cash flows that are that negative, she's probably gonna push the, the farm purchase back uh, another year or two. So Nathan, let's stop there and see if there are questions or comments about any of that. Sure. Um, one question is, are there income caps to qualify for a USDA beginning farmer loan? There is not really an income cap for the, for the beginning farmer down payment program. There's a, a limit on how much land you can already own. And so if you own, I think it's more than I think if you own land that's more than 30% of the average size of a farm in your county, then you're not eligible for the program. Huh. Okay. But I'm not aware of any income cap. I've never run into an income cap if there is. I have run into the that um, you can't own more than a certain amount of land. And I don't even run into that very often, just once in a while. I also have a question. How do you prove you have two years of farming experience? We are not a farm registered with FSA. We have a farm and have been running it for four years. Yeah, it's, um, you, well, there's a couple different ways that you can prove that farm management experience. So if it's your own farm and you've been filing a Schedule F, um, you can show your Schedule F income. And so that's why I, I always encourage a farmer who's just getting started, be sure to file a Schedule F the very first year that you're farming. Even if you've got very little income and you've got a fair amount of expense or you're selling at farmer's market and you don't expect to really even bring in more than $1,000, still file a Schedule F because it shows that you've, you've been operating as a for-profit farming enterprise. Um, the other thing that you can do if you're working for someone else and you've been managing their operations or managing a portion of their operations, they can write a letter and say, yeah, this person was making management level decisions in my, my farm business and did that for two years or three years or whatever it is. Um, FSA wants to see three years of farming experience or farm management experience, but you can replace one of those years with military service or with education or with um, operating a non-farm business. So there's a lot of different ways to, to kind of get around that requirement or at least minimize that requirement, I should say. Excellent. Then I have a kind of question and statement. I've discussed with a lot of current farmers, prospective farmers, and a major issue is often healthcare insurance. Most have a partner that maintains the off-farm job for that and some stable income. 
you have any suggestions on that? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, in my mind, I think one of the biggest barriers to entrepreneurship, whether it's farming or other types of entrepreneurship, is the cost of healthcare. You know, it's especially for farming, it's for farmers, very expensive, not very good coverage, high deductibles. Um, a number of farmers have taken advantage of the ACA and, and have enrolled in um, uh, essentially Obamacare and brought their, uh, their premiums down. Uh, here in Wisconsin, we have Badger Care, which is uh, Medicaid, basically. Um, and some farmers have, have accessed that program. But yeah, health insurance is, is a big detriment to entrepreneurship, unfortunately. Got it. Then we have someone who offered an idea for Mary. Uh, Mary could explore high value specialty crops and leverage the restaurant, restaurant relationships. Yeah, that's true. And that's, you know, in, in reality, she's going to look at this. If, if she's sitting down, she's putting this cash flow projection together and she's doing it today in 2021, projecting out to 2023 and seeing, you know, 2023, the cash flow is negative by 10,000 and some dollars and 2024, it's going to be negative by 30 some thousand dollars. Yeah, she's going to be changing up her plan, you know, and, and um, you know, modifying what she's going to grow and, and how she's going to market and those sorts of things. I mean, she's not you know, I don't think anybody would, would, you know, plan to go in and lose $36,000, you know, so yeah, hopefully she would, she'd be changing that, that plan up. Yep. And we have a question from Tom. How would you see the livestock enterprises benefiting this scenario? Don't they add costs such as feed and labor and uh, I could don't, don't know what the other one is, fencing costs? Right. Yeah. Yeah. A livestock enterprise definitely would be adding costs, um, but it also is adding revenue too, depending on what kind of livestock you're doing. And there, there again, it's it's why it's important to do a cash flow projection because if you're uh, if you're going to be producing poultry, you know that it turns pretty fast. You know, it turns in two to three months. If you're producing pork, it's turning in five to six months. If you're producing beef, especially if you're a cow calf operation you may not generate any cash flow for two or three years, you know? And so that's why it's so important to do that cash flow projection and be able to figure out when is the, when are the expenses being incurred and when can you expect some cash coming in? So if she's looking at a livestock enterprise and in, in a situation like that, where she's already got um, CSA subscribers, she's already selling to restaurants and selling direct to, um, to friends and family, um, if she adds a livestock enterprise, she's already got the market built. If she can just sell more products into that market, um, you know, and it could be honey. I know we've got a couple of beekeepers on. I'm a, I'm a beekeeper myself. Um, it could be, you know, eggs. It could be a lot of different things. You know, it's it's maximizing the amount that um, of revenue that you're generating from the markets that you've already developed. Got it. We have someone um, mentioning that if Mary is wanting to be more sustainable organic. There are new programs with large companies who will work with and pay farmers for soil saving, carbon saving data. Have you heard about that, Paul? Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about carbon markets. And in fact, uh, here within Compere, we, we formed a carbon team uh, the first of the year, um, partially to help our, our uh, members try to figure out how to access carbon markets, whether carbon markets are are a viable option for them. Um, and they are paying, you know, I, I think it's about seven bucks an acre, maybe 10 bucks an acre for, for carbon credits. Hmm. Um, I, I, think, I think the jury's out a bit on, uh, on whether or not carbon markets are really gonna be what they seem to promise. You know, we used to have uh, the Chicago Climate Exchange where carbon credits were being traded and that market folded. Um, California has a pretty robust market. Um, the European Union has a robust market, but here, I don't know. It's I'm not quite sure where we're where we're going to come down on that yet. Got it. I'm hoping that it's there, and I hope it's I hope it's tied to the amount of carbon that's sequestered. You know, it seems like a lot of it is right now. The discussion is a lot about cover cropping, yep. uh, but things like managed grazing are going to sequester so much more carbon than cover crops will. And so, will grazers be paid? $20 an acre while a cover cropper gets paid $5 an acre. That part hasn't been figured out yet. Got it. Before I uh, mention another question or two, uh, I know for some people in the audience, um, 
enterprise budgets and balance sheets are probably not too new, but for someone who's kind of new to that, can you, uh, what do you recommend for resources either online or do you recommend your book, Fearless Farm Finances? Where can you go to create those, learn more about enterprise budgets and balance sheets? Yeah, um, in the book, we, we talk a lot about balance sheets and enterprise budgets and cash flows. Okay. Um, in the book is available through Moses. It's I, I should mention I don't own the rights to the book, so if you buy the book, it's Moses makes money, and, and that's great. But uh, <laughs> and I'm proud of the book. I think it turned out really nice. Um, but there's also there are balance sheets all over the place. I mean, send me an email and I'll send you. I can send you three or four different different balance sheets. And with my clients, I have I have probably half a dozen different balance sheets depending on the complexity of the operation. You know, I've got some that are pretty complex. And so we gather a lot of balance sheet detail and there's long lists of machinery and things like that. Others, if it's a beginning farmer, start, a startup operation, you don't have a lot of equipment or something. I've got a really simple balance sheet that I use with folks like that. In fact, it's the one that, that was in the example. Okay. Um, that cash flow projection spreadsheet that I showed, I'm happy to share that. That's on our website. It's on compure.com. You can find it there or send me an email and I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, and then I've got a little business plan template that I, I use with a lot of my uh, farmers. So yeah, there's there's a lot of places to get those resources. Okay, great. Then there's uh, one comment was, there are also healthcare sharing companies that are worth looking into as an alternate to healthcare. My family uses this and we've found it to be affordable. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. I wonder if um, yeah. if the person who made that comment could maybe expand on that a little. Uh, Jim, do you want to share just a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I, th there's a few of them out there that I know of. Um, the one that we use is called Samaritan. You can look it up. Uh, some of them are faith-based. Um, some of them are not. But uh, essentially, it's not it's not health insurance, but it's shared health care where people you, you you pay a monthly amount into it, and everyone's medical expenses within the the group are shared, um, so it's somewhat can be more affordable than than different um, health insurance options out there. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that's I actually have a lot of Amish farmers in my portfolio, and and uh, of course Amish people don't use conventional insurance, um, and but they do kind of what you're talking about, Jim, where they're hmm. you know if someone incurs a big medical expense, the community comes together and and helps them cover it. Mm -hmm. Got it. And then last question, uh, and we should probably keep moving, is uh, what about federal conservation grants in terms of the role they can help in terms of income for what you're doing? They're, um, they're great. Yeah, if you can, if you can get uh, an EQIP grant through the Natural Resources Conservation Service, like if you're, um, oh, the, Tom's comment about livestock and the cost of fencing and things, if you're planning to do managed grazing, um, you can apply for an NRCS grant uh, through the EQIP program, Environmental Quality Incentives Program, I believe is the, the acronym, um, that'll cost share that fencing. On my own farm, we, uh, we did cost sharing for a stream bank stabilization project. And the, in theory, the cost share was 70% of the cost of the project. But uh, the way that NRCS pays, they figure out what that, that project should cost and then they'll say okay we'll pay you 70 percent of that amount it isn't the actual expense so i had a contractor that looked at the project and he said whatever nrcs gives you for this i'll just take that and we'll call it good and so it didn't end up costing us anything out of pocket and you know we got our whole stream bank rip wrapped and and stabilized Excellent. so yeah I, I love those programs and they're very easy to apply for um, NRCS staff, typically they fill the application out for you, you sign it, you know, you kind of go over the plan together. And if the cost sharing seems reasonable, you sign it, it goes in and a couple times a year they score them. And if you score well enough, you get the project. Got it. All right, uh, when we get back, I'm kind of anxious for Mary's fate. So I'd love to hear more about what Mary's gonna do. <laughs> okay, so what's Mary gonna do? Um, here, let me back up a slide. So I think I jumped one. Okay, so what if instead of buying a farm, so Mary looks at this projection and she says, I don't really wanna lose $36,000 a year. Um, I think I'd rather maybe stay with the farm that she's already on, that she's renting and make some modest capital investments on that farm and see if that would make sense. So if you remember looking at 
at Mary's balance sheet in 2023, at the beginning of 2023, she had she had a little over $10,000 between her personal accounts and her farm checking account. So let's say she takes that $10,000 and she invests in a hoop house and it's on this rented farm that she's been using for her first two years of production. She enters into a five-year lease agreement for the land. So she wants to have control of that land for a longer period of time. So she's gonna enter into a five-year lease agreement. Um, by putting in the hoop house, she's gonna extend her growing season She's going to be able to increase her annual net cash flow from the farm operation by at least $4,000 a year, she figures. Um, and she's going to be able to maintain her off farm income. So it's going to kind of spread her season out a bit more, spread her cash flow out, but it's going to increase her cash flow because she's going to be able to extend her season by being able to grow undercover. At the end of five years, she figures that the value of the hoop house is going to be zero. She's going to put $10,000 into it today. She's going to um, generate extra cash flow by $4,000 a year for five years. And at the end of five years, there's no value left in it at all. She walks away from it. Does that make any sense to make that kind of an investment? Well, when we start talking about investment, it forces us to think about how the value of money changes over time. And this is the thing I, I alluded to very early on. Um, when you're starting with not much and you wanna own a farm or you wanna make wise investment decisions, you're saving your money, you wanna make sure that you're not throwing your money at things that aren't smart investments. Um, we have to start thinking about the time value of money. So if we invest in something, the sooner we get a payment back on that investment we make, the better off we are. If we get money today, we can invest that money in something else, or we can use it to stop interest from accruing if we have debts. The other thing is we've got inflation and inflation for a long time was low. It looks like it's, it's creeping up now. I don't know if it's permanent or not, but certainly we're seeing inflation. Um, inflation causes your money to lose buying power over time. So if inflation is at 5%, your money at the end of the year is gonna be worth 5% less in buying power than it is today. So the, the sooner we get money, the better off we are. When we make a, an investment, we know we're not gonna get that money back right away, right? So when we make an investment, we're expecting the, that investment to pay off in the future, at some point in the future. And so we have to adjust the value of a future payment to reflect the cost of having to wait for it to come back to us. The longer we have to wait to get a payment, the bigger that payment has to be in order to adjust and, and compensate us for the, uh, the value of the time that we had to wait for it to come to us. The longer we wait, the greater the risk that we're not going to get paid back. You know, anything can happen. The economy can crash. Inflation could, could escalate out of control. Interest rates could go through the roof. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen, and there's more risk that you're not going to get paid back for your investment. So back in the old days, you could put money into a uh, savings account at a bank. It would earn something called compound interest. So you go into the bank and it would say our compound interest rate today is 2%. So you knew if you put money in a savings account, you would earn 2% compound interest. So within a year's time, you'd get 2% on top of the money that you put in. The next year you'd get another 2%, but it would be applied also to the amount of interest that was in that account. So it's compounding over time. So if we know what the compound interest rate is, we can say, if I put $10,000 into this investment, whether it's a savings account or some other investment, and we know we're gonna get a, a, a compounded interest rate, we can figure out in the future, three years from now, four years from now, five years from now, how much that's gonna be worth. It's gonna be, in this case, 10,000 plus whatever that interest is. Well, we can do the same thing going the other direction. If someone says, I'm gonna give you a payment of $10,000 three years from now, we can decide what kind of interest rate we wanna earn on that money, and we can discount it back to today's dollars. So we can basically take the interest off and say, okay, well, I'm gonna give you less than 10,000 today because I know you're gonna give me 10,000 back in the future. We're discounting, we have to discount from the future to today. Here's an example. So if we were at a 3% uh, interest rate, option A, we're putting $10,000 into this investment. It's gonna compound at 3% a year. We're gonna get 10,000 the first year, 10,000 plus 3% interest. The next year, uh, 10,000 plus interest, plus interest on the interest. We're gonna end up at the end of three years with $10,927. If someone says, I'm gonna give you a $10,000 payment three years from now, and you say, well, I want a 3% uh, rate of return on my money, I'm gonna discount from that $10,000, I'm gonna subtract off the interest, I'm gonna give that person $9,151 today. 
three years from now, they give me 10,000, I've gotten 3% return on my money. So that's discounting. So how do we establish a discount rate? You know, if we're looking at a compound interest rate or we're looking at an investment where they say, we're gonna give you a 5% return on your investment, we can compound and we can calculate that out. How do we establish a discount rate though? If we, if we decide we're gonna make an investment and I don't wanna make an investment unless I get a certain percentage on my money, how do we establish that? Well, you could use the interest rate that you'd have to pay to get a loan for the investment. You could use the prime lending rate and add to it the rate of inflation. Um, so right now that might be, you know, 3% plus another three or 4%. Um, we could establish a personal hurdle rate. We could say, I'm not making an investment in anything unless I get a 10% uh, rate of return on my money. I want a, at least a 10% because I, I'm not going to risk my money for less than that. Um, whatever method we use to, de to determine what this discount rate is, we have to adjust for the riskiness of the investment. The more risky an investment is, the greater the discount rate that we should be applying to it. This whole thing is referred to as net present value. So looking at that, that $10,000 payment three years from now and discounting at 3% back to today's dollars and it ends up being $9,100, that's the net present value of that future payment. So we can figure out what a future cash payment is worth in today's dollars. We can also convert a whole stream of future cash flows over a number of years into a single current value and say, okay, well, if I get a stream of cash flow, every year I get so many dollars for the next 10 years, I can um, discount all that back to today's dollars and say, okay, if I put 10,000 into this today, I'm gonna get a 5% uh, rate of return on my money. This calculation is gonna tell us if an opportunity is a good investment. It's gonna tell us if it meets our hurdle rate or not. It's not gonna tell us if it's the best investment of our dollars. Um, the only way we can do that is by looking at uh, different investments, different potential investments that we can make. So applying this to Mary's situation, if she took her $10,000 out of her savings and she invested in a hoop house, so she takes that 10,000 today, plunks it down on a hoop house, sets it up on a rented farm. She knows she's gonna be able to generate $4,000 in annual net cash flow every year. And at the end of five years, it's gonna be worth nothing. Well, that first year's um, $4,000, we have to wait a whole year for that to come. So because we're waiting, we have to discount it back to today's dollars. And we're gonna apply a 5% discount rate um, to that money. So because she has to wait a whole year for that first payment to come back, in today's dollars, it's only worth $3,809. That second year's payment, again, she has to wait two years now to get that payment to come back. That's only worth 36.28 in today's dollars. And the third year's payment is worth 34.55 in today's dollars. You know, we're discounting back to today at a 5% discount rate. We add up all these numbers in this column here, the net present value of each cash flow for each of those five years. We total it up, it totals up to $17,317. Now, because the initial cash outlay, the $10,000 that we put out um, is less than that $17,317, that's the, the present value of the um, cash flows, we know that this is a better than 5% rate of return on this investment. We don't know exactly what the rate of return is on the investment, but we know it's better than 5%. So back in the old days, when I learned how to do this, we didn't have computers to, to run these numbers. So we had to just keep plugging in different numbers to run these, um, these net present values. Well, now we can take this one step farther and we can calculate what the internal rate of return is on this investment. The internal rate of return basically just takes those discount factors and just keeps plugging in different discount rates until we get one that gives us that the bottom line number that would be ten thousand dollars, you know. So it just keeps trying different different uh, discount factors until we we get a net present value of that stream of cash flow that's equal to our initial investment. Um, it's going to estimate the annual rate of return on our initial cash investment. By doing this, it allows us to compare investments of different dollar amounts and different lifespans. So maybe one investment's $10,000, one investment's $8,000, one's $5,000, one has a five-year life, one has an eight-year life, one has a 10-year life. We can compare those investments to each other and figure out, okay, if I only have so much money I can put into anything, here's the place where I'm gonna put it that's gonna, gonna give me my best bang for my buck. So what is the internal rate of return on that $10,000 hoop house investment? Well, here's that 10,000 that we put in year zero, that's today. Here's the $4,000 of cash flow each year for five years. 
the salvage value at the end of the fifth year is zero. The internal rate of return, if we keep running different discount factors till we get to the one where that bottom line number is $10,000, the internal rate of return on this investment is 28.65%. So it's a pretty darn good investment. If she could take $10,000, and turn that into $4,000 a year for five years, even when at the end of that fifth year, it's worth nothing, the hoop house is just a pile of junk and we walk away from it, it still got, uh, still gave her a 28.65% internal rate of return on, on her initial cash investment. So it turned out to be a pretty good investment. Hey, Paul, can I just jump in real quick? Yeah, you bet, I was gonna stop anyway. Yeah, because I think there's a lot of diversity and sort of financial background in our audience. So first of all, how did you calculate the 28.65%? This is um, a little spreadsheet. So it's the spreadsheet is automatically um, doing that calculation that I showed in the previous chart. Okay. I plugged in a discount factor and I actually you know, calculated the numbers. Um, like I say, back when I learned how to do this, we had to do it by hand. You know, We had tables of discount factors and you had to keep plugging it in to figure out what the, the internal rate of return was. Um, this just automatically does it. So it's, it's um, it just keeps trying different discount factors until it gets to the one where the net present value of that stream of cash flow over five years is equal to the initial cash investment that you made. Okay, I guess to be very honest, I'm, I'm probably not as financially astute as I'd like to be. So when you say the net cash flow equals $10,000, that doesn't completely make sense to me. <laughs> yeah, here, let me, let me back up. Maybe I can yeah. explain it a little bit better. Okay, so, <clears throat> so right here, you know, we're putting $10,000 in. So it's a negative number today. Um, we know that this investment, she calculated the cash flow and figures she's gonna make an extra $4,000 of net cash flow each year from having this hoop house, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, we're, we have to adjust for the, the time value of the money. You know, she's not gonna get that $4,000 tomorrow. You know, she has to wait a whole year for it to come. Well, if we use a 5% discount rate on, the, on that money, um, that cash flow at the end of a year uh, in today's dollars is only worth $3,800. You know, it's not worth 4,000. We had to discount it because we didn't get it right away. We had to wait a whole year for it to come. And then the second year's cash flow, we had to wait two years for that to come to us. So that's only worth $3,600 in today's dollars. And then the third year, we had to wait three years for that to come. So that's worth even less to us in today's dollars. You know, we're trying to figure out what's this future payment worth in today's dollars if it's discounted at a 5% rate. Got it. So and so- um, okay. I'm sorry, you know, keep at, going. Well, I was gonna say, so at a, at a 5% rate, that stream of cash flow, the net present value of that whole stream of cash flow over five years in today's dollars is worth $17,317. So it's worth a lot more than we paid, right? Yep. We only paid 10,000. Yep. This stream of cash flow is worth 17,000 at a 5% discount rate. So we know this investment is better than a 5% rate of return. If it was a 5% rate of return, the stream of cash flow would total up to $10,000 here. So we know it's a better than 5% than rate of return on the money, but we don't know exactly how much it is. We, to do that, we'd have to keep plugging in a 6% discount rate, a 7% discount rate. You know, and these numbers are gonna come down with each, each percentage increase in the discount oh. rate. And we wanna to get to the point where it's 10,000, where it's exactly equal to the initial payment that we made. And that's gonna tell us what the, the internal rate of return is on the investment. Okay, so we, uh, I think we have someone who's gonna jump in. Um, why don't you go ahead, Nourish Kitchen. <laughs> can you- Oh, hi, it's speak? Pierre. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can speak. Uh, I just had a quick, just making sure I kind of like understood this. So if I had a farm and I was like, okay, a hoop house costs $10,000 and I know I can make about $4,000, uh, a $4,000 uh, project out of that hoop house annually. Is this worth my while to make this? Because I want to make sure I make back at least that ten thousand dollars in five years. This calculation you've made just kind of confirms that because I've essentially made back or will be kind of making a twenty-eight percent return on my investment based off of the calculation. 
right? And so it's right. like a really good rate of return. So you would yeah. definitely want to do that. And if you could even run a larger enterprise out of your hoop house, then you would increase your rate of return within that five years, all everything's still kind of the same cost as far as like the hoop house. Right, yeah, it's, it's really saying, um, I've got 10,000 and I could, and I could invest this 10,000 in buying land, or I could invest this 10,000 in a herd of beef cows, or I could invest this 10,000 in a hoop house, mm -hmm. which one of these things is going to give me the best rate of return on my money, you know? And um, then to like move forward, the next step is like, if the hoop, if I wanted to put the heater in my hoop house, so it costs 15,000, as long as my enterprise then could double to like 8,000, it'll probably be somewhere in a rate of like 30 plus percent on return after five years. So that's probably even a better investment to maybe find out how to make more money by investing in like a higher value house, potentially, if you get have access to that capital initially. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, and that's that's why it's such a powerful tool. And it's something we don't use in agriculture very much, but in businesses outside of agriculture, it's used all the time. Like no real estate investor, no commercial real estate investor would ever make an investment without running an internal rate of return calculation because they don't they don't want to lock themselves into a 5% internal rate of return. They want a 15% rate of return. You know, they and that's how they build wealth over time. Um yeah, so that's why I say it's such a powerful tool. It's not used very much in agriculture. And because it's not, I see people, it's, it's a thing that I see a lot of beginning farmers do. They think, well, I want to own land. So I'm just going to buy land. And yeah, maybe they can make the cash flow work. But was it, good, was it a good investment? Was that the best use of $10,000 or $20,000? You may lock yourself into a really, really low rate of return. And then you don't have any option to ever invest in anything else. And so you're locked in to poverty basically your whole life. You know, it's, that's why this is such a powerful tool, especially for people who are starting with very little, you know. Okay, so we do have a question uh, and I don't, I wanna make sure we get through the end of your slides, Paul, but we have a question. Would you explain the factor at 5% discount rate column very, very briefly? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, so there's, uh, like I mentioned before, back when we had to calculate these things by hand, and we don't, we don't calculate this by hand anymore, but I, I use it just as an example of how, this, how the math works behind the scenes. Um, but when we're discounting, we have to apply this discount factor, you know, and there's, there are tables of discount factors that you can find at, from 1% to 50% discount rates, right? And it's, it's um, if you're going to do the calculation longhand, you have to you have to uh, plug in these discount factors. Um, okay. But like I say, we don't really do it anymore. They're spreadsheets. I've got an app on my phone that I use most of the time. I can run these in you know a matter of seconds, where so back in the old days it would take me 15, 20 minutes to calculate it. So it sounds a little bit a little bit arcane to me. So, but maybe we could provide a resource that will help people understand that a little better. I think the big question for me, and I, I want us to keep going, is that it seems that I think some people would say, yeah, I'm completely about my finances and getting the greatest rate, rate of return. And I think there might be some people who um, are like, finances are great, but I really, my heart tells me that just having land would make me feel more secure. So yeah. maybe come to, come to that sort of at the end. I wanna make sure we have enough time for, for questions. Yeah, and I, I actually don't have a lot more slides, but um, but I totally get what you're saying, Nathan. And it's you know, and even personally, I showed those pictures of of my land, which I bought I think six years ago now. Um, but to and the internal rate of return on my land is really low. It's not good, but it's a it's the culmination of of a lifelong dream, you know. And to get to that point, I owned residential rental property. I owned farmland in North Dakota. You know, I, I made a series of investments that gave me a really good internal rate of return so that at some point I could achieve my dream that doesn't really have a very good rate of return because it does touch my heart, you know? Um, and so that's why, especially beginning farmers, it's so important to understand this concept so that you can achieve your dream and not get locked into kind of a, you know, an endless loop of 
constantly trying to come up with the cash flow to make the thing work, you know? Okay, so why don't we finish up because I think we want to come back to this question of, of the financial way of looking at the world, which I think a lot of people don't do in their everyday life. <laughs> and, right. And I think that for beginning farmers who, who aren't thinking that way, I think that financial set of glasses is the most challenging part of, I think, what you're, what you're presenting. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we'll finish up here and then, um, yeah, and then we can talk more about this. I actually have some articles that I've written about internal rate of return calculations with more examples. Um, there's a chapter in Fearless Farm Finances that I wrote on, on farm investment analysis um, that explains the same concept. So yeah, so there's some other resources. So we calculated the internal rate of return on the hoop house, that $10,000 investment was 28.65%, which is fantastic. You know, if, if uh, that money was sitting in a, even a high yield savings account right now is paying 0.4%. So if she could take that 10,000 and invest it in something that's given her a 28.65% rate of return, that's fantastic. You know, that's, that's all that cash is going into her savings account and helping her with a down payment on a farm five years from now, right? So what does all this stuff have to do with farming? Well, we can calculate this internal rate of return on any investment, any investment we wanna make, whether it's a piece of equipment, a piece of land, a hoop house, beef cow herd, whatever, we can calculate the internal rate of return on any investment if we know three things. The cash investment that's required up front. So in this case, it was 10,000 that she had to put into it. Um, if we can estimate the annual cash flow, in this case, it was $4,000. And then if we can estimate what the remaining value of the investment is at a given point in its lifespan, whether it's five years, 10 years, you know, whenever, as long as we can calculate it at some point, um, we can figure out what the internal rate of return is. And if we can do that, then before we make an investment, we can decide, is this giving us a decent enough internal rate of return that it's worth putting the money into it? Or should we not and sit on the money and find something else to invest in? So let's go back and look at the farm purchase scenario. So we went through the hoop house. It looks like it makes really good sense to do the hoop house, but what about that farm purchase? Well, she was gonna sell her house and she was gonna have 60,000 of cash to invest in the new farm, right? So that was the upfront cash investment, 60,000. So there's the first of the three things we need to know for internal rate of return. We saw that the 2024 uh, cash flow, which is sort of the stabilized cash flow of the farm operation was projected to be negative by $36,000. Well, as she gets into this, she makes some adjustments. She reduces that negative annual cash flow to $15,000. So she changes up her enterprises, changes up her marketing strategies and stuff, but she still has a $15,000 shortfall to make up. So she's gonna work off farm and invest that 15,000 that she makes off farm. She's gonna put sink it back into the farm every year to make up that annual cash shortfall. The farm is gonna be increasing in value though, because it's, you know, farmland has been increasing in value, you know, every year except during the farm crisis of the eighties. So it, it keeps going up. So she's assuming that it's gonna keep going up while she owns it. We're gonna increase the value by 3% per year. If we calculate that out five years from now, the farm's gonna be worth 463,710. She paid 400,000 for it. So just the market value of the farm is gonna go up by 63,710 by her owning it. When she bought the farm, she put 40,000 into a hoop house irrigation, some home remodeling. That's not gonna add any, we're gonna assume it's not gonna add any more market values. So the, the market value of the farm five years from now, we're estimating to be 463,710. Over that time frame, she's gonna be paying down the principal on those two real estate loans though. And that started out at 380,000. She's gonna be down to 323,260 at the end of five years. So her equity position in five years is gonna be $140,450. You know, and she put in 60 up, up front. She's gonna end up with 140,450, but she also had to put in 15,000 each year to make up that cash flow shortfall. So what's that gonna look like in terms of internal rate of return? Well, here's the 60,000 she put in up front. Here's that negative 15,000 a year. So she has to plug 15,000 into the farm every year to make up that cash shortfall, right? And then at the end of five years, the farm is gonna be worth $140,450. So she's got that, but the internal rate of return on that investment is 1.19%. So it's a really low internal rate of return. She may still make the investment though. You know, and a lot of people would, but 
I think it's important to go in and make that investment with your eyes wide open, you know, and again, I'll, I, going back to my own situation, I, I haven't even calculated the internal rate of return on, on my own farm. I don't have a debt, any debt against it. If the cash flow is basically break even every year, um, is it a good investment? It's increasing in value every year. Um, is it the best internal rate of return I'm going to get on any investment I make? Definitely not. I mean, I've got, I still own some residential rental property that gives me better than a 15% internal rate of return. My farm's not giving me that. But because I made these other investments, it, it made it possible for me to have sort of the luxury of having this investment that doesn't generate a very good return. But at least not in money, it gives me a great return in uh, emotional satisfaction and happiness. So, and that's worth a lot too. So just to finish up here, and then we'll, we'll take some questions. Um, it takes some time to understand internal rate of return. I understand that this concept is probably brand new to a lot of you. And, it, and when I first learned it, it took me a long time to really get a good handle on it, understand it. And then once I understood it, to trust my ability to calculate it, and then trust my ability to make an investment decision based on the calculations that I did. But I have done that over the years and I and have done really, really well for myself without ever, uh, you know, without coming from much of anything to start and not having a very high salary for many, many years while I've been working. Um, if you make an investment on rented land, then investment has to be under your control for long enough to get the cash flow back out of it. You know, and I think we saw that with the, with the hoop house. If her lease ended after two years and she lost the investment in that, that hoop house, the internal rate of return is not going to be 28%. It might actually be negative. So you have to have control over that land for enough time to get the investment back out. And it's the same if you had livestock on rented pasture or something and you put in fence. You have to have control of it long enough to get your investment back out and it has to come out in the form of cash flow. Um, there can be good reasons to make it a cap, make a capital investment, even if those net present value slash internal rate of return calculations don't support it. You know, again, my own situation, I went ahead and bought a farm, even though it doesn't, it, you know, the internal rate of return calculations would say, go invest someplace else. Um, I had this conversation yesterday with one of my clients who's, he's got a piece of machinery that's kind of on its last legs. He's limping it along. Uh, we did an internal rate of return calculation to see if it made sense to replace the piece of equipment. It doesn't. The internal rate of return calculation is negative, but this machine is limping along. He can't get parts for it anymore. So he's, he's in a position he's going to have to make the investment, even though it, it doesn't make sense from a, uh, an internal rate of return calculation. Um, month by month cash flow projections are particularly important if you're relying on income from the farm to support family living costs. You don't want to cut yourself short on family living. Uh, you don't want to underestimate what it's going to cost for health insurance or for other costs uh, that fall under the category of family living. And then finally, don't let tax avoidance drive farm investment decisions. Um, you know, make sure that it, it makes good financial sense, not just uh, sense in, in the fact that it reduces your income tax liability to zero. So Nathan, that's what I've got. Um, yeah, happy to open it up for questions, comments, discussion. Nathan, you're muted. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Paul. If people have questions, I would love to share this, share the questions with him. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Um, one question I have for you, I guess, is the foundation of your thinking about all this and how you present it is the, having a balance sheet, which is very clear. seems like you can't waffle too much with that. But the enterprise budget is a budget. So you're essentially assuming things are going to happen. Should we be applying a discount rate to our enterprise budget and say there's a risk? So if we think the enterprise budget is 20,000 in a year, that maybe we discount it to 18. So we're just being a little bit more conservative. Yeah, I typically encourage people to, to err on the side of caution and be, okay. you know, be conservative on their uh, enterprise budgets. And then also in their cash flow projections too, you know, and that's that's where you know people uh, sometimes have a tendency to maybe underestimate what family living cost is going to be, you know, and they think, well, I can get by on two thousand dollars a month. Well, if you've got a family, you're never going to get by on two thousand dollars a month, you know. Um, yeah. 
so yeah, you, you want to be, you want to be realistic. If you're um, mm. plugging in off farm income, you also want to be cognizant of the fact that you, if you're plugging off farm income into that farm cash flow projection, um, it's, you, that's not a problem if it's not a problem for you. I mean, as long as you're, you go in it with your eyes open and say, okay, well, I know I'm going to have to um, subsidize the farm every year to the tune of $10,000, but um, right. yeah, so that's, that's kind of okay. where, where it is. I think we have a good question here. Uh, it often feels like we will never be able to afford to buy our own farmland. Do you ever work with farmers with different operations seeking to buy land together? Can that help it make, make it more feasible? Yeah, let, um, sorry, I'm just, I wanna read the question again. Sort of like cooperative oh, sure. purchases. Yeah, yeah, I've done that. Uh, I financed farms that, that were being purchased by multiple entities. Um, huh. Yeah, yeah, that can work. Yeah, it's more common within a family, but um, but we finance farms where it's two partners that came together, and uh, whether they're domestic partners or just business partners, they and they've purchased land together. Okay. And then, uh, what do you recommend in terms of a safety net or contingency fund, and how does that factor into all of this? I think I know a number of different financial, personal financial advisors recommending having you know three to six months worth of living expenses set aside. How do, how do you think about that? Yeah, the, what, uh, the number that we look at is, is net working capital. So if you look at the balance sheet, and I talked about current assets and current liabilities, yeah. if you take current assets minus current liabilities, it gives you a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. That dollar amount should be at least 15% of gross farm income. Mm. So if the farm is going to gross $100,000 a year, we want about 15000 of net working capital. And it's not necessarily cash. That's that's the other thing. Farmers will say, "Well, why would I want to sit on fifteen thousand dollars of cash?" You just said that you know, even in a high yield savings account, it generates 0.4 percent. Why would I want to do that? Well, current assets again can be cash, or it can be um, prepaid expenses, or it can be market livestock, or it can be crops in inventory. It's growing crops. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can hold current assets, and sometimes the return on the on those forms of holding current assets. Like if um, your seed dealer offers you a 15% discount if you pay cash today, that's like getting a 15% rate of return on the cash that you invested in that, that uh, prepaid um, supply, right? So mm. yeah, so there's, there's um, different ways of, of looking at how, that, how you're holding your net working capital. You want some cash, but it's the net working capital that's the, really the, the number that's important. Okay. So we have an interesting comment and then another question. Uh, also remember revenue does not equal profit. Which is a, you, can be, you could be generating a lot of revenue but not actually making money. That's very true. And then yeah. we have, we have a, a comment from Katie Adams from Savannah Institute. Let me see if I can get my chat to work. Uh, my farmer partner husband and I are coming to the hard conclusion that we'll, we will never be able to buy land. Could these financial statements be a powerful lease negotiating tool? We raise oh. perennial, perennial crops, so a long-term lease, 30 plus years, is what we need to expand our business. Yeah, it, it definitely can be a good negotiating tool for a lease, uh, a lease agreement. Um, because, and, and it can, I have another presentation I do just strictly for grazers and looking at leasing pasture and whether it makes sense for the landowner to invest in fence or the, or the renter to invest in fence. And, and you can work it out to a point where it really makes good financial sense for both of them to make some investment. You know, maybe the, the renter does the labor and the landowner puts the materials in. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. And you can show that, that the internal rate of return, because you're putting the land into a more productive use, that it benefits the landowner. Um, and it's, and I, um, part of the question there, the comment there too is, um, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want people to leave this thinking, this presentation thinking, well, forget it. You're never going to own land. My my real goal is to say, okay, well, when early on, make those really good, sound investment decisions that are giving you a really good internal rate of return. And it could be from perennial crops. It could be from fence. Mm -hmm. It could be from a hoop house, because that's going to set you up for 
the future when it when it, it is time to buy land. You know, you'll have more of a nest egg. You'll have a, a better down payment. You'll be in a much stronger position that won't have you struggling with cash flow every year. You know. So, so yeah, I don't uh, want to be discouraging, but I just I I just want to make the point. I just don't want people to make a, a bad mistake right out of the gate and lock themselves into a one percent internal rate of return that's going to force you to just beat your head against a wall year after year trying to come up with the cash flow. Yeah. So there's an interesting book called Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. And one of the, one of the, it sounds hokey, but it's actually a very powerful book. It's about your money mindset, how you think about money. And a lot of us just think about it. Do we have money in our checking account? <laughs> That's what we think. And so they encourage people to actually look at their balance sheet, their net worth actually every month. And to yeah. start get get that mindset of how am I growing my balance sheet versus am I generating money that's then being spent in some other way? So that's that's a really good approach. Uh, we did had a question earlier. Uh, we are sixty and sixty two and both still working. Isn't it too late to start on investing? No, I don't think it's ever too late to start on investing. And there and it's just a matter of of you know, finding the right investments, you know, and the, the investments that are giving you a, a rate of return that's better than the rate of inflation or better than the rate of borrowed money. You know, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to go and borrow money at, at five, well, this example that we used, she's borrowing money even at one and a half or 5% to generate a, a 1% internal rate of return. You know, that's, that gets you stuck in that negative loop where you're just constantly, yep. you're on a hamster wheel, you know, um, if you can invest in things that are giving you a 10, 15% internal rate of return, and those aren't things that are going to be advertised in the newspaper. I mean, they're, you're, you know, it's things like owning residential rental property or something. It's, they're not, they're not necessarily easy things to do, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's never too late to start making those kinds of investments. So one of the, uh, I guess the fundamental questions I have is I think for a lot of people who are just beginning to get financially uh, informed and educated, how can they get, is it, I know that this is kind of a leading question, but can they contact you or are there other people you recommend that they just, just to help them warm up, learn how to apply these questions and then eventually they can do it on their own? Yeah, that's, um, I, I work with a lot of people on these sorts of things okay. and it's not, we don't charge anything for it. I mean, it's just, um, we're a farmer owned cooperative and it's part of our mission to help people be successful in their farming operations, you know? And so, um, yeah, I just, if I can help somebody, you know, get started on the right track and not make bad decisions. And I mean, I'm in the business of making mortgage loans, right? So, and I'm telling people, don't, don't buy land. It doesn't make sense to do that. And I will tell you that I'm not going to tell you, you should do it. Um, but if we run these numbers and you say, I, no, I still want to do it and the cash flow works and you've decided you want to do it. I, I'm probably still going to make the loan to you, but I at least I'm going to feel like I, I presented you with the information you needed to make the best decision that you could. Got it. Uh, so we also have a great comment. I would also recommend to diversify the farm, such as value added products and agritourism, in addition to your initial growing crops, adding these to your business plan, it would help getting a loan for land or lease. Uh, does that, how does that sound, Paul? Yeah, um, I would say generally that's true. Um, sometimes it's a little bit tricky because some enterprises, they don't have a, much of a track record. You know, we've got the program that, that Cy and I run, we work with a lot of diversified operations. So we kind of understand what the cash flow looks like, but, um, but a lot of lenders don't, don't understand what's the, what does cash flow look like for a, an on-farm cheese plant, you know, um, or, direct market meat operation or something like that. It's, they may never have seen that. Where if it's a conventional 200 cow dairy operation, they're, they can go to the University of Minnesota and pull benchmark reports from 600 farms that all fit that profile, you know? And they can say, okay, well, the cash flow that they put in their business plan pretty much lines up with this Finbin cash flow. And so I think, yeah, we'll make the loan. But when it's a diversified enterprise, it's, it's a little bit tougher sometimes. Oh, that's interesting. And what about, um, again, we're looking for other questions. I'm happy to sort of share those questions. Uh, whether it's your off-farm job or your farming enterprise, is an investment in education that enables you to boost that off-farm income or, in, or boost your ability to do more farming or add the value enterprise 
at an enterprise, is that something people should be thinking? Because I, I think sometimes people look for an off-farm job that's just, it's there, it's easy to get versus sort of saying, what's my core value or competency and I can make more money or I can build that, that skill so I can make more money more efficiently. Yeah, it's, that's, um, that's a tough one. It, and I run into it sometimes. I mean, there's some folks that have a lot of student loan debt. Wow. And um, in fact, I, I had a tough one earlier this year where um, they had a, a significant amount of student loan debt, like, like a lot of student loan debt. And the, um, the spouse that had that debt was working a, a part-time job, a very low wage part-time job, and then working on the farm. Um, that, you know, it was one of those cases, like you've got this degree and that would enable you to make well over $100,000 a year. And you've chosen to take a job that pays you about $6,000 a year. And then you're working on the farm. Um, and then you're mad because I can't make a loan to you. But I, you know, I'm looking at your balance sheet and I, you've got this major debt that doesn't have a hard asset against it and doesn't, and doesn't have an income generating uh, cash flow item to plug into it either, right? So, um, yeah, that, that's that's a tough situation, you know. Um, yeah. So, uh, what I'd like to suggest, if it's okay with you, Paul, is that we kind of officially close it, close the, the webinar. If there are a few people who want to hang on and ask a few more questions after that, perhaps we could do that. Would that would that be okay? Sure. Yeah, you bet. Awesome. Well, first of all, Paul, thank you so much. This has been really useful, I think, and really, I think it's been a even though I've actually heard some of the concepts before, it's still a paradigm shift for me to think about how I use money in terms of the, the internal rate of return versus other options. So that's super helpful. Uh, I also wanna um, let everyone know, we're gonna send out an email with a link to uh, actually a number of links to the video of this presentation to other resources that Paul recommends. And we're gonna include a, a survey, a feedback survey that would be super helpful if people could respond to to add incentive, we are investing with for our own internal rate of return in incentives for people to fill out the survey. Um, the we're gonna do a drawing after the deadline that people submit their feedback surveys by. And if you're one of the 10 people we choose, you, you'll be able to choose between a free copy of Fearless Farm Finances that Paul co-wrote or uh, the book Quality Agriculture, a collection of transcripts of podcasts that John Kempf did with a number of innovative scientists and farmers. Uh, John Kempf is one of my favorite podcasters, brilliant guy about uh, farming. So please respond, that would be awesome. Uh, and again, we wish everyone great success and health with your farm. Let us know how Jim and I can help you. And again, we'll look for that email soon. Have a great night. If you wanna stay on and talk a little further with Paul, please do so.